Galatians chapter 5, live by the Spirit. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature's desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, and drunkenness, and orgies, and just in case he missed yours, and the like. <laughs> I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things. There is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. We're coming through towards the end of Galatians here. And Paul is sort of wrapping things up in a big package at the end. But this is one of those passages. We've all studied the fruits of the Spirit. And we've talked about, you know, the sinful nature and all of its desires. And, and if you're like me, uh, you know, I grew up in classes where we just broke each one down. You ever had one of those? You ever fucking, it lasted like six months where we just spent, you know, we're going to talk about patience today. We're going to talk about, you know, self-control. We're going to talk about goodness and faithfulness. Then we went through all the... Um, other ones, you know, and you, you get to debauchery, it's like, who even knows what that means, but it sounds awful. Um, you know, and it, it just it, people giving over themselves to the, to the desires of the flesh. And, and, and I don't want to, you know, do that this morning. I, I think, you know, we, it would just, we, like I said, I could do a, almost a year-long sermon series on, on if we broke down each one. And we've done that a lot in the past. So I want to try to get a bigger picture, or at least Paul's big picture of what he's talking about here. He's been dealing a lot with legalism, a lot with traditionalism, a lot with uh, what they call gnomism, that just where if it's not the legalism of the law, it's the legalism where we sort of made up our own rules. Um, and, and again, we do that. That's a human nature problem. Uh, that's not limited to our movement as churches. It's, it's, uh, I've talked to a lot of ministers and other denominations. Everyone seems to have, you know, the, they slip in their own rules whether they're written down or not. And that's one of the things that Paul is dealing with here, and, and mostly with these guys that have come in and talking about we've got to follow the law in order to be real Christians. And uh, he's been dealing with that. He's also addressed the extreme of using our freedom in Christ from the law to, to give free license to sin. And he's definitely against that as well. And so you kind of wonder, okay, well, you've got the legalism on one side, and you've got this you know, freedom on the other side. And so the, the sort of, uh, you know, the logical thing to do would be to try to split the difference, right? I mean, you know, obviously we can't be too legalistic, but we've got to maintain some holiness, you know. Uh, but we can't be too free, or, you know, we might give, give license to sinful nature. Um, and so, you, you know, you... you Think you know, you try to find a middle road, but that's not what Paul does here. Paul says no; he, he's not shooting for a middle ground. He's taking us to a higher road, a road that's above our weak, selfish, sinful nature. And we need to pay attention because this is critical. Too often we try to split the difference, and that won't do us any good. We've got to go to a higher road. So I say live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. That there, there's something 
dramatically opposed by the sinful nature and the spirit that God has given us. There's your spirit, but he's talking about the spirit that God gives you won't allow you to gratify the sinful nature. He gives us this in picture of, 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 it's almost like, you know, when you try to take a north and south magnet and try to stick them together. They, they just, you, you can force it, but it's, it's weird and it doesn't want to do that. There's a, there's a tension between the spirit and the flesh. They're, they're just opposed to each other. They don't sit well together. And it's amazing because God gives us his spirit, which we understand and we believe. When you're baptized in the name of the Son of Jesus Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, for the remission of your sins, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And yet somehow our weak, selfish, sinful nature is still in there too. And you think, well, how can, how do those two get, get along? And, and the answer is, they don't. Now, if you're, you know, like me, the, the closer you get to God, you start to become more and more aware of how that sin nature tends to try to assert itself. You know, I was I marveled at the way Paul says, I'm the chiefest of sinners. And you think, really? You know, the Apostle Paul, the chiefest of sinners? That's because he's comparing himself to Jesus Christ, and he looks pretty bad at that point. You see, if we start comparing ourselves to others, you might think, well, I'm not that bad. But you're not supposed to compare yourself to anybody else except Christ, in which case we're all pretty messed up sinners. And so the Spirit is trying to get us to think differently and therefore talk differently and act differently to rearrange our priorities. And that's the tension that we often feel. I always laugh. People say, you know, I'll say, oh, boy, you look a little tired, Daniel. Well, I didn't sleep too well last night. Well, how come? I said, probably guilty conscience. And, and they're always like, oh, right, you know, they think I'm joking. No, it's probably a guilty conscience. You see, the closer we get to God, the more we realize how much we need him. How much the blood of Jesus has to cover my weak, selfish, sinful self. And, and the struggles and the tensions within me. And it's not even just, you know, doing wrong things. It's that I'm, I become aware of all these things I should be doing, and I'm not. And, and, and it's, like, it's one of those things where the tension's always there because just as I feel like I've sort of conquered one particular area in my life, God, like, you know, he sets up a whole new spotlight on another one that I need to work on. And at this point in my life, I think I'm just never going to get through them all. He keeps calling me to higher ground. He keeps calling all of us to higher ground. That's, that's the tension of the spirit within us. He says, good job, but there's more to work on. And that's, there, there's this tension. These two are diametrically opposed. There's our flesh, there's our living in the world, and then there's the Spirit of God within us. When we're in Christ, he dwells. God lives in us. That's just amazing. I mean, I just, that's just mind-blowing. The creator of the universe steps in and parks with us and starts talking to us. We got that pesky free will that still reigns within us, that, that weak selfishness that attacks all of us. One of my favorite uh, Christian uh, counselors named Larry Crabb, uh, some of you may have read his books, but he, he talks about that we're so fallen that even the good things we do are usually selfishly motivated. <laughs> That, 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 that sin sort of taints just about everything we put our hands on. And, and, and there's this constant tension within our spirits. And Paul points out, look, if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. If you've been paying attention to the text, there's something wrong there. What's Paul been talking about just now? Talking about the sinful nature. You would expect him to say, if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the sinful nature. But that's not what he says. He says you're not under the law. That's kind of strange. 
It doesn't, you know, it, it, you know, if you're reading along, you sort of get that, you expect the sinful nature, and he sticks law in there, and it makes you step back. And, and as they taught us in school, when, when that happens, you're supposed to step back and go, what's that doing there? What's going on? This isn't right. He interchanges sinful nature and the law, and there's a good reason for that. They're tied to each other. They spark off of each other. You know, most rules and regulations are made because someone does something incredibly foolish, or incredibly immoral or wrong. I love one guy was talking about, they were I was watching the news, they were talking about population explosions and how to handle it. And, and one guy said, you know, I, I've, I've, I've thought of the solution. We should just take the warning labels off everything and let nature take its course. <laughs> Ever thought about that? I mean, I love it. I remember when I bought my first big gas barbecue grill. And there's a little sticker right on the front that says, not for indoor use. <laughs> you can just see it, can't you? Hey, honey, the stove is broken. Hey, we got the gas grill. It's gas. That's gas. What the heck? Let's bring it in. <laughs> and the house burned down. Yeah. Or my other favorite is I was changing the fan belt on my, on my car, and I got it out, and it says right there, it says, turn engine off <laughs> before attempting to replace. You can just see that first guy. You know. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> it's like, really? And it's, it's stuff like that that, that we have to have come up with laws. Nature, you know, people do foolish things, they do wrong things or immoral things, and suddenly we got to make a rule. You know, there was never a rule about throwing balls in the house until someone threw one and broke one of the vases. And then the rule. And that's, that's what the law is about. It's, it's, it's about dealing with our sinful nature, our careless nature, our selfish nature. That's why the rules get written. But they actually key off of each other. You know, if you walk in a house and there's a whole bunch of rules, you know you got some rough kids. <laughs> you know, you don't need rules when people behave properly. The law and the sinful nature, they, they're closely connected, according to Paul. They have a, a synergistic relationship. One works off the other. And you know how that works, too. As a kid, yeah, I remember my mother said, you know, do not go in the living room. You know, we bought new furniture, new carpet, and she told all of us, don't go in the living room. There must be something pretty cool in the living room. <laughs> I mean, it must be really awesome. So I remember one time when no one was looking, I went in the living room. It was kind of boring. <laughs> everything was all clean, everything was nice, you know. Was, you were afraid to mess anything up. The rules are because people mess stuff up. And, and, it, and it sparks that temptation. It, 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 it creates that, you know, boy, if there's a rule against it, it must be something fun in there. You know, don't stay up past 11. I stayed up past 11 once just to see what kind of fun. You know, it's, it's not that fun. I kind of like to sleep now. You know, it's a, um, we have this desire. Our selfish nature just wants to experience something, and they work off of each other. That's why Paul connects these two. We need to understand law and the sinful nature are tied together. The spirit takes us to a higher road. The Spirit takes us out of all of that into a higher plane, a better way of living. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, and orgies, and the like. I mean, that's quite a list. And it's not exhaustive. Paul's got other lists elsewhere where he's got different stuff in there. And these are all things that destroy relationships. You need to understand when God has rules, it's about relationships. All you read through the old law, it's about getting along. It's about building community. It's about building each other up. It's about not taking advantage of each other. That's what the law was about. But people always wanted to break it. But there's some weird things in this list. You know, you notice that you look at that, you know, he says, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality. I don't think that came as a surprise to anybody. 
impurity and debauchery, which means just giving yourself over to licentiousness, uh, sensual enjoyment. Idolatry, witchcraft, oh, we know those are bad, right? I mean, that, didn't, that shouldn't have come as a shock. But then he gets into this other stuff, it's a little weird. Hatred, discord, just means someone who just generally likes to stir up trouble. Jealousy, anybody ever been jealous? Fits of rage. Selfish ambition. I mean, you, you almost can't be a card-carrying American without some selfish ambition, right? Well, that's part of our culture. That's one of the foundational bases of capitalism. Dissension. Factions. You ever have kind of your own little group of friends you like to hang out with and not anybody else? That's kind of what factions are. Them and us. Envy. You ever been envious to somebody? Yeah, I remember that first time, you know, I was so glad. I, I, I finally got, my dad gave me the car. You know, I'd been taking care of it for two years, and he gave me my, the station wagon, Toyota Corona station wagon. And it was all mine. And I was going away to college. And I remember pulling my, I was just so proud to have a car. It was my car, and I, I pulled into Pepperdine with my green Corona station wagon next to the BMW and the Mercedes. <laughs> and suddenly my car just didn't look so cool anymore. <laughs> the envy started creeping in. How come they got and I don't? You start looking at this list, there's, there's stuff in here it's a, just a little, you know, I don't, you know, you're talking about sexual immorality and idolatry. You know, I don't have any trouble with that. Debauchery, you know, I generally try to stay away from words that I can barely pronounce, you know. And, and, and so, you, you know, those aren't too much trouble, but hatred? I've had, I've had some people I hated in my lifetime. Discord? I've had some people I just did not get along with. Faction? There have been times where I had a group of friends and there were people that we, we deliberately excluded. Certainly struggle with envy, selfish ambition. I mean, that's almost, that's, that's almost just like saying, you know, are you human? Do you want to get something for yourself? You know, I remember one preacher even talking about it. He says, you know, he said, I realized I was bothered by other ministers' success. And he said, it wasn't so much that I was against them being successful, I just didn't want them to be too successful. Because that created the envy. He got infringed on his own selfish ambition. So we look down through here, we start to see, we, we expect the others in the list, but, but some of those we would consider, you know, I mean, fits of rage, everyone loses their temper, right? The Bible connects anger and demons. Very literally. Uh, Ephesians talks about don't let the sun go down on your anger lest you give Satan a foothold. The Bible takes losing your temper a lot more seriously than we often do. And Paul makes it very clear those who live like this will not. He doesn't say might not. He says will not. Inherit the kingdom of God. Now I find this interesting in this discussion about the grace of God. Freedom in Christ. And we've been going through Galatians and he's trying to get them off this legalism, off this idea. You're saved by the blood of Jesus. You're saved by the grace of God. You can't earn it yourself. It's all about God's blood shed for you. Salvation has been offered. And then he throws in something like this. And what he's letting them know is If you don't respond to God's grace, if we don't recognize the gift that has been given and respond accordingly, if impacting the blood of Jesus doesn't radically change our lives, if accepting the grace of God doesn't reorient the way we think, if having the Spirit of God live within us doesn't change our values 
and how we plan to spend our time and our money. There's something really, really wrong. And he's making it clear to the Galatians, yeah, you've got the grace of God, you can't earn it, it's been given to you, but don't think you can continue to behave like this and claim you've got the grace of God. They don't go together. The grace of God is the power of God to overcome sin before and after. And we're all very gracious for that after. But we need to recognize when we're in Christ, when we have the Spirit of God, that God extends his grace before we sin to give us the strength not to. He extends his spirit into our lives to say, you know what, that is not what you should be doing. That is not how you should be spending your time. Those are not the things you should be saying to people you care about. If he starts telling us, don't live like this, that's why we have the spirit within us. Fruits of the Spirit. Now, this is a more fun discussion, isn't it? Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, those things we would expect again. But patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things. There is no law. And where's hope in, in all this? And again, I, I appreciate the way Paul says, against such things there is no law, because that, that sort of implies there's other th such things. It's not a comprehensive list. But we, we see love, joy, and peace, and we expect that, but the others are very relationally oriented. They're, they're directed at how we get along with other people. And you think, well, those aren't, this isn't the gifts of the Spirit. This is the fruits. Okay? This is the result of the Spirit taking control in our lives. We will just treat people better with gentleness, self-control. You know, it's one of those things, I, I, I've done some counseling with some guys who had some real anger management issues. And it was destroying their families, destroying their marriage, children. And, and, and when I talked to them, they would just say, you know, I just, I just can't control it. You know, it, I can't control it. It just comes on me, and I go crazy, and I start saying things and doing things that I shouldn't do. And I, but I, I, it's, it, I, there's nothing I can do about it. My first question is always, so, so this happens at work? Well, no, I, I don't do that at work. I'd get fired. So maybe it's not uncontrollable. Maybe you just find a place where you feel it's okay to let it out. But just like you can get fired from work, you can get fired from your marriage. We've seen that all too often. Self-control is a sign that the Spirit has gotten a hold of us. And we stop saying those things, and we stop losing our temper. And we stop discouraging other people. We start treating them with gentleness and kindness. And that starts at home and spreads out. Paul's understanding of being led by the Spirit appears to be an orientation that is selfless and not selfish. And if you're ever really questioning, let's see, is this the Spirit or not, that's, that's a real easy gauge. You know, you got, you got kind of like the gas gauge, you got selfish and selfless. And where's the needle in there? Is, is this action or is this plan of yours designed to benefit you? Or is it actually designed to benefit somebody else? That's a really good indication of whether you're letting the Spirit guide us or not. Whether we're, we're letting the Spirit tell us what to do. Is what, are the plans selfish or selfless? And I'm not saying don't take care of yourself. I mean, we, there, there's lots of basic needs you need to take care of, but some of us take a little too good care of ourselves, as is evidenced often uh, in our parents. That we, we focus a little too much on our own needs, wants, desires, and not enough on others. Ramifications belong to Christ. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. That's a very good, clear picture. We, I did this once at a Pepperdine retreat. We, I was in charge of the communion. And we, what I had, I had everybody just write down the things they struggle with the most. And we actually had a cross 
set up in front of the communion table. And each person came up and nailed their struggle to that cross before they took communion. Left quite an impact on a lot of people. And it's something I'd like you to visualize when you're struggling with something, is get it and nail it to the cross. When you, when you accepted Christ, when you were baptized into his name, you were nailing the selfishness and all that goes with that to the cross. And you're going to let the spirit take over. I mean, we all want to have that full gospel benefit, right? I mean, the grace of God sounds so awesome. The love of God is great. The mercy that he pours upon us, the blood of Jesus, we're all in for that. But are we willing to take all of those sinful desires, passions of the flesh, and nail them to the cross? If you're like me, we're like, you know, uh, uh, yeah, this is all bad, and let's let's put it up here on the cross. And well, maybe not this one. We'll just kind of, you know, you know, this one's not that bad, really. We'll just, you know, we'll, and we, we 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 get a little, you know, picky about hanging on to a couple things we got to take them all. That's when the spirit starts saying, ah, ah. And you reach it, ah. Who said that? I just want to take, ah. The spirit's letting you know. You're going you're gonna to feel better. You're going to act better. You're going to enjoy the spirit of God better. If you get rid of those things and nail them to the cross. And the problem with this whole thing is it's not a one-time deal. Have you ever thought you forgave someone and then something happens and you realize I didn't forgive them? <laughs> happens to me all the time. You think, you know, I put that behind me and then something will happen and all that floods right back in. You really, okay, I'm going to have to forgive them again. And again. It's not a one-time deal. The Spirit is working on us daily. And it's an ongoing process. You know, that's the whole thing. We... we I think we've been very good about teaching and preaching about justification. But this is the sanctification part. This is the cleansing that goes on between here and Jesus coming back. And that's what we're talking about here. It's also not optional. And that's what Paul's telling them. Look, if, you're, if you know you've got a problem and you're going to just hang, I'm sorry, God, I'm going to keep that one. That's when Paul says, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he's wanting, wanting to make sure they understand this grace, but that that's not a license to sin. That we're free from the law, but that doesn't give you the freedom to do anything you want. It's just not acceptable. Those who live like this, according to the sinful nature, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Conclusion, since we live by the Spirit, maybe, am I the only one who's found this strange? Since you live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Doesn't that sound redundant? If you live by the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit. I had to really work on this one. What does that mean? And I finally figured it out. I mean, it's a great conclusion, but it sounds kind of cliche even, you know. If you live by the Spirit, walk by the Spirit. Well, what it's saying is, living by the Spirit doesn't address the issue of the Spirit's pace in your life, in my life. But the Spirit has a plan. God has a plan for you. And sometimes we're, we're, we're in the Spirit, but we're just dragging our feet a little. Need some spiritual caffeine to get us going here. Because you're not keeping up. He's saying, if you live by the Spirit, you need to keep up with the Spirit. Listen to God and let him move you according to his plan and you will become the person he created you to be. Created me to be. We don't just need to follow him, we need to keep up. Keep growing, keep transforming, keep changing. And not be stagnant. You know, that's one of those things, I'll just warn you, if you come into my office for counseling, I always... It just makes me laugh every time I hear this. You know, I'll get a couple, they've been married 15 years, and one of them will say, you know, she's not or he's not the, the, the person I married 15 years ago. And I think, well, praise God. <laughs> we, 
would you want to marry someone and, th and then never change, never mature, never grow, never extend or expand their interests? Or, I mean, we're all changing. The one constant in life is change, transformation. In Christ, it's supposed to be transformation. We're supposed to be growing. I praise God I'm not the man I was 32 years ago when we got married, and I guarantee you Allison does too. We're supposed to be growing. We're supposed to be keeping in step with the Spirit. And just in case we or the Galatians miss the practical point, he says, let us not be conceited, arrogant, provoking, or envying each other. Sounds simple, doesn't it? Seems easy. Do you go out in the parking lot and say, how come I don't have a car like that? Do you admire other people's houses in an envious way instead of a God-praising way? Do you thank God for what you have? Or are you upset because of what you don't have? Those are the things we need to be careful about because these are the very practical outcomes of living by the Spirit and keeping in step with the Spirit. This week, let the Spirit lead us into selfless paths of service. Use that as your gauge, as my gauge, to is this about me, or is this about glorifying God and serving others? Because the two greatest commandments are to love God and love your neighbor. So use that. Let the Spirit guide you on that so that God's name will be glorified because of our selfless service to others. If you have any needs this morning, please come as we stand and sing.